Don't, don't yeah. sit, sit next to you. Is it three? No. It was three. It was three. Yeah, two. That's fine. Start of the DN3 project. We had the DN3 architecture workshop. Of course, those were very focused on the Xiang architecture, not so much on the inland, but still from all these presentations. And um, I see very much the difference between at the start of the DN3 project and now. The presentations I heard for the past two days have been a good deal more pragmatic and much more focused on we are implementing this <coughs> rather than we have all these fancy ideas. So, so I think there has been a change. Um, I think people are at a different stage in the technology cycle, at least most of the networks are at a different stage in the technology cycle, and I think in different thoughts. Um, so I think that's, that's quite different. Um, maybe linked to that, I don't know, and that this leads to my first question for, for you guys in the panel, because you're going to do the work, I'm just going to introduce you. Um, is that I thought them very pragmatic, presentations, um, presentations focused on adapting existing technologies or doing, implementing the network in slightly new <coughs> ways, pretty much the same type of core architectures, uh, pretty much the same type of transport, pretty much the same kind of IP service, um, lots of incremental innovations, slightly different ways of doing things, slightly different ways of using the transport slightly different ways of controlling the network, except for the two presentations from our American friends. Right. They, particularly Internet 2 presentation, of course, had lots of innovation in the core. Right. They actually were trying to do the core in a very different way than what we used to do. They were introducing new technology right in the core. I don't know how wise it is, but it's certainly very different. Um, whereas in Europe, I think, also not just in this meeting, also from recent conferences I've been to, most of the innovation seems to be happening above the net. We're talking a lot of a about AI and about services, about network as a service, about higher layer innovation. So it seems that currently to me that in Europe, we're thinking that I would pretty much understand how to build the network. Right? We have some choices depending on when that we talk to, but we pretty much we understand how this is transport, MPLS, IP, we know how to do this stuff. Um, so the innovation we're focused on is somewhere else. It's above the net. Whereas in the US, it seems, they think there is a new innovation cycle at the core. Um, so they're trying to do that. So either they are going horribly wrong, or we are being left behind if it's happened before. Um, so I want to ask you guys, which, which, which of these are true? Which, which is it? Why, why is there this difference? Yeah. Uh, my, my perception is that, for instance, uh, a good example is uh, mentioned today uh, Federica network by Mauro. Uh, for instance, uh, as far as I know, Federica uses some uh, resources taken from uh, Jean network. So the links are provided by Jean network. And then Federica provides some resources to the, to the uh, three projects uh, Mauro yeah. mentioned, yeah, Novi and, and uh, yeah. Bonfire and so on. Yeah. So Federica expects to have stable resources. So Jean Network has to provide pretty stable resources for Federica. And Federica also as a project network is 
going to provide stable resources for other researchers. Yeah, so we cannot play with Jean network doing experiments inside Jean network because Federica expects stable service. Yeah, so I think the the idea from the uh, yesterday's presentations uh, about from from Snet, I like that the conclusion we can implement very uh, innovate uh, architectures on the edge of the network, but we need stable core. So that was what I liked from, from the yesterday's presentation. And I think we're doing so, so, so something uh, pretty similar because uh, we have stable Jean network, then we built, uh, for instance, Federica infrastructure for that, and uh, there was probably some experiments doing on, on the beginning of a Federica project. When the, the Federica infrastructure becomes stable, then it started to provide services for other researchers, yeah? yeah. Other so points? Mm -hmm. So I think we are going in a good direction. Well, yeah, there are two points. One is that Internet2 and ESnet are single domains. We should mm -hmm. always remember that we are actually talking about 40 domains. In the sure. And so innovating 40 domains at the same time is not what probably we want to do right. in, in one day. And the second point is that there is a profound difference, in my experience, in the American universities approach to networking and what we have in Europe. Mm -hmm. So there is also a difference of what the user requests. If I have to think about Italy, uh, most of the researchers are about wireless. They are not interested in fixing the wireless. Mm -hmm. They are more connected to providers. So I think there are also good reasons why this is so. It's not our fault. It's mm -hmm. just technical differences and also user-based differences that brings us to that. Okay. Victor? Uh, perhaps I have another I idea. I, I think it, that's I think we, we try to, at least in HN, we try to push new things in, in the core. Uh, we, we, we try to take the risk of pilots directly in the core. Um, in some way, new technologies. But the other thing is also, that let's say the, 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 the testing that in uh, happens in, in America with uh, open flow, I would almost say, uh, that's very good. I think they should do that. But if they do it very well, then I don't have to do it. And then I can concentrate on something else. Because, yeah, I, I don't want to invent a new open flow. So we would almost uh, 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 yeah, do something or similar or not. So I, I try to, to, to utilize more. I see OpenFlow as a technology and if you want to use it, just use it. Mm. And that's more or less the multi-domain aspect. Uh, in Europe we will never say that everybody will use OpenFlow. Right? I'm sure no. that somebody wants OpenFlow, the other one wants closed flow and whatever flows they want. So, But I, I'm glad that they do it. I think it's essential that they do it. So, uh, yeah, what do you want to do? What, what do you like to do? Uh, I think we have that freedom also. There is another thing that we have to... We shouldn't think that we have to change completely the architecture of our networks. So OpenFlow, everything... OpenFlow is fold so that if you enable OpenFlow, all the rest is gone. In the, in the hardware boxes. Everything goes into the controller. So essentially is con conquering everything, killing everything, and then replacing everything. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is, is a sound model for our networks. What I try to do, software mm -hmm. defined networking, virtualization, is that we can have more architectures. Mm -hmm. And probably this simplicity of having actually more than one type of architecture is what we should follow. Because that is natural with the equipment we have. It can provide the right environment to whatever we have and still maintain the production environment at a stable level. Yeah. I see no reason mm -hmm. why we shouldn't have a stable environment and a research environment at the same time yeah. on, on, on the same type of resources. If you want. I, I, I would not risk to change everything at the same time just for the sake of changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it succeeds in the United States, hooray. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's a risk I can't take, mm -hmm. for example. So what I'm hearing from several of you, I think, is that we probably have in Europe a more production-oriented mm -hmm. focus on the research network than they have in the U.S. But why do you think this may, is a problem? Maybe, maybe, may, I, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's a problem. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just chart. asking, I'm trying yeah. to figure out if, if this is what is going on, because we're seeing some differences. And maybe, if we see a difference, it's always worth considering, are we losing something? We might not be losing something, but, but it's always worth thinking about I wonder about whether it. it's because it's driven from a different place. So mm -hmm. in, in the US, it's, it comes out of the campuses and Stanford and that innovation, mm -hmm. and they're driving it, and, uh, and they're interested <coughs> in the edge, and the, you know, they're, they're innovating on the edge, but lower layers of the edge. Mm. Uh, and perhaps uh, the difference there is we, we, that particular innovation is, is, is a very US one. And we don't necessarily have an equivalent one uh, to look at. So, so the, qu the question is, perhaps, perhaps the US model is more bottom-up innovation so coming from the users, where, whereas perhaps we have more of a top-down, uh, EC-driven piece of cash. We're, we're, we're more let's, let's innovate with it. We're more telco -like. Well, not necessarily. Uh, possibly more, yeah, maybe more centralised. I don't yeah. I, I, I understand some of the reasons. Mm -hmm. I just, I think the interesting question is: Are we losing something, or is it is it fine? Right, Victor. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that losing. But before that, I, I was thinking about. Um, Let's say, uh, you can say they take a risk, but let's say Bent was on the mount. I think they took a risk and it was quite successful there. Yeah, and uh, we didn't dare to make it an operational service after so many, you know, only after two or three years. So, uh, and they tested it out and, and they made it very fast a production service mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, and perhaps it still had its problems, but they still went for it. I think we, we are more yeah, afraid to, to do these kind of things in Europe uh, environment, I think. Uh, so uh, I don't know if it will happen with open flow, by the way. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what open flow, what the importance is of open flow, but that's because I don't know it. Yeah, so. well, there's a point there that maybe mm -hmm. there's a difference in speed because of the difference in approach, because yeah. of it yeah. being more campus driven or whatever. Mm. We've seen it before that it takes a long time to make decisions in this young yeah. yeah. project. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. and that it just. Yeah. But I think it's again that multi-domain. Yeah. 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 If yeah. there two can make one decision, we have to so for some I reason. I understand that this is young, but but we yeah. have thirty n runs and yeah. a number yeah. of n runs here. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that not not one of these n runs either have done it in at home. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. have, have done something radically different. But yeah, very long. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on demand, demand, but not, not we oh, no, 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 the no, presentation no. we've yeah. seen here yeah. is still mm -hmm. same type of transport with IP and PLS oh, yeah. blah, 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 network. Yeah. Yeah. Fine, yeah. Yeah. we do the same. Okay. Right. So not <laughs> everything is wrong. It's just in interesting to me that there is this. Yeah. this, this yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, the other thing that, that I heard yesterday, I, when I said it myself, I think. Uh, based on the reaction of yesterday, it, it looks that we are have a problem that there are so many different things going on in these new things. Yeah, like, like there are 30 projects or 34 uh, icons, I think, of projects looking at the network. Oh, I, I love that. Because if you had only one, there would not be a choice and you would never know what is the best way to do it. Because I'm sure that uh, uh, OpenFo version 1 is not the correct one. Uh, I already know that now. So. I assume you have to have open flow number three or whatever. So, so diversity I like now, certainly in at this moment. But it has to end. Yeah. All right. I want to stress again one thing. Even if we test these kind of things, including bandit on demand, we have to put that in production. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like to ask a simple question. Since when you're using bandit on demand, essentially you're using the resources of someone. And those resources are very expensive because we are talking intercontinental capacity, European wide capacity. I got that the problem is the deal, dealing with these non technical. It's a real issue, it's a business model. Example suppose we connect United States and Europe for bandwidth on demand, and a researcher in Italy, not in Germany, <laughs> or other asked for a capacity of one gig, not more, up to Washington. Who pays? Mm -hmm. Who is responsible for the usage of that resources, which especially in the intercontinental link are probably around, I don't know, 5,000 K a day? So that's the real stop gap. This is where we have to look at. I mean, 
I, I got a distinct feeling that during the last five years we moved from technical issues to political issues and economy issues. Mm -hmm. We cannot just rub there under the counter. No? Okay. We have to look at a sound model, simple model, but sound, so that we can also step over the financial model in a sound way. Probably we have to collaborate. We can decide that we have a small pool for each of the other NRS to use and then decide some policies, simple things. I have a free I have a fear that as I saw that happen, it gets too complicated day one. Well, this is why trust I th I hope will be still there in our environment. Because we need to trust one each other up to a certain level of course. <laughs> but we need to trust. If we if we involve the lawyers and if we find try to find all the details, then we are done. And this is, in my opinion, much more dangerous than the technical limitation. Uh, in the very example you're giving, that is very fundamental to mentally, <coughs> unfortunately, it's still been the technical issue. I mean, the, the example you're giving is, actually, we have users now asking for, and we're just getting there, like, actually giving the circuit. But it's still been the technical issue much more, actually, than the, uh, the financial issue. Right now, everyone, like, on both sides of the Atlantic for, for this kind of circus. Everyone in this period is saying, you know, we're not going to charge each other. Yeah. But, but, if you but, if but, but only until it becomes a production service. Yes. Okay. If, if, if you're successful solving the technical problem, the economic problem will show up. Though, we have, in theory, we have the same problem with the, with the shared IP service, right? Somebody could start, just start using 10 gig UDP, right? Yes. And, and, but yes. we, we seem to be handling that problem okay and been doing that for many years, right? I think uh, a small side comment is to advertise the banner on demand workshop in Utrecht if Tanguy didn't already do that yesterday. So, yep. 3rd and 4th of December, right? Yes. Yes. <coughs> so so come there if you want to dis dis decide on policy for that service. Yeah. I'm sure Mauro wants to because he has strong opinions. Uh, uh, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I perhaps I, I look at these kind of things as, as I, I see bandwidth demand as a resource, and resource has a property, or many properties, one of them is bandwidth and manageability or whatever, and energy consumption and so on, but, and the other one is cost. And so I know the cost of a 10 gigabit Xi'an plus link, I know that it's 50,000 a year or whatever, yeah? That's a fixed price that I have to pay to Xi'an at this moment, so if I have so one gigabit cost me 5,000 per year or whatever it, it, money there is. So it's for me a black box. There's a cost related to that. And if I have to build up my costing to the client, it's just using all these resources, these building blocks, these Lego stones and add them together. And perhaps I can say, oh, HNL finds so important, we make the cost zero to the client. But that's a decision that, that is separate from the actual cost. I can fund it to the client, but the, the cost is known. And perhaps Giant doesn't calculate a cost of 50,000 correct, but that's their problem, not mine. Yeah, it's outsourced. Yeah, they have to provide the right cost as part of the when I get a resource with a property cost. And the cost sharing working group. Uh, yeah, and I, I let them They are not valid for interconnected. But that's their work. They, if they, they have I to I do I that. The challenge that is a technical issue. They have very good bandwidth on demand on the other side of the ocean, we can. The real issue is the use of that resource. Uh, I mean, I can give you very concrete examples. Uh, and, and because of the migration of new platforms that are appearing, it's unfortunately, I mean, we're just getting there, but it's, it's still technically uh, challenging sometimes for certificate issues and, and such. Uh, but. Um, but yeah, there, there are actually users asking for transatlantic circuits. No, I know. But that's yeah. a risk if you want. It's yeah. a beauty and the risk at the same time because, because it's it's people start using it, then it will vanish in no time. Well, I think that uh, our environment is much different uh, from uh, Internet 2. I'm, I, I'm I don't know very well the structure of Internet 2, but I understand that they are much, uh, there are single domain, which is a very important property. <laughs> they are much closer to the campus network so it is more easy for them to deploy new services 
uh, we have a lot of problems that are not technical. And uh, for example, with bandwidth on demand, one problem that uh, I'm not sure how will be tackled is uh, uh, authorization. So you have not seen this because you, you do not have so many so many requests right now. But uh, what will happen if uh, you start saturating uh, uh, circuits? Uh, so suppose that uh, I have a 10 gig uh, link uh, dedicated for one on demand in Greece. And I have uh, 30, 40, 100 uh, requests there. And I will have to choose, how will I be able to choose which one I will, uh, I will allow there and which, will, which ones I will drop? The policy and for this is, dis is December. No, the, the policy? December to the morning. Uh, yes, but this, yeah. is, this, this is not. Okay, we will uh, come up with a policy, but uh, it is not a, an, an easy. Uh, it, it is not an easy question. So I, I really want to see what, <laughs> what, what the policy will be. But uh, I doubt uh, that it will manage to uh, to solve um, uh, issues uh, uh, if we actually have a lot of uh, requests and the line starts saturating. So uh, in the states, I think that these problems are uh, mi are uh, minimized because it's a single domain. So they know their users. It is easier to set up policies. It is very hard to set up policies in GRNet uh, for users that are in. Uh, uh, PSNC, Janet, or in a terror, or whatever else, yeah. but I do not know them. The basic principle is you, you, you are responsible for your GRM. Well, the, trust each other between well the, we, the same problem, we run the same problem, you know about the, the VPN uh, request from GRNet. Yes. Uh, we, we ran into exactly this uh, problem very recently. Uh, but not to get this discussion sidetracked into one about the POD because that's on other forums, but. Oh, well, I was going to talk about BOT. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I was, I was going to say, I mean, the, only, the only bandwidth that BOT creates is an extra header on the packets. I'm assuming that whether there's BOT or not, people still want to get the packets from Janet through to Internet 2. Um, uh, so uh, assuming that you're not blocking bandwidth, by, but by, uh, which is the current model that, uh, that, that uh, Janet is going for, by uh, working on capacity planning rather than bandwidth reservation, um, does BOD actually create an extra demand for shipping packets above and beyond uh, the generic growth of traffic anyway? Yeah. But that's the point. One thing is that you allow statistical multiplexing. One thing is that you say these are circuits. There is a profound difference on, on the impact. And that if you are using statistical multiplexing, there is no difference mm -hmm. rather than using standard IP. Maybe you want a layer two circuits, but in practice you're just sending frames to the to the pipe and they go yeah. out to the other side of the ocean. But if if instead people start thinking that they need reserved capacity and they need a, a real mm -hmm. circuit of some kind, then you're doomed, in my opinion, in no time. So that's a real challenge of bandwidth on demand. If you apply bandwidth on demand in terms of, of uh, statistical multiplexing, why? No, I mean, uh, the, the <coughs> factor for <coughs> service on demand is 4,096 VLAN IDs, not 10 gigabits, 40 gigabits, 100 gigabits of bandwidth. And, th and that's the other point. If, if we start using 10 gig, which I imagine major researchers around the world might want to use, or between clouds, or as soon as the people mm -hmm. start to understand that they need to ship in and out of the clouds a lot of information, then the 10 gig will become a not so cheap way of doing that. Then. Well, I think we are we're touching on some of the issues we also discussed, uh, I think it was yesterday. Is it really bandwidth on demand or is it connectivity on demand? And as <coughs> you mentioned today, is it that multi provisioning tool we are after rather because most of the environments we have shown that they, they, they are operating the network, but not because of bandwidth, uh, bandwidth extortion or fiber extortion. There's plenty of bandwidth, so it's not bandwidth we're missing. It's the connectivity on demand, I think, more. And, and, and that's a whole other issue. And, and I agree with Mauro, of course, that uh, transatlantic circuits are, in principle, uh, uh, more expensive. But if the, if the channel's already provisioned and we are just trying to get over the hurdles of sending 30 ways to get a connection from, from Copenhagen to the US and, and can do it with a, a GUI. That's a great leap ahead, especially because we are multi-domain service or environment and not a single domain. So we cannot cross from Copenhagen to Madrid 
in one day with the same engineers. We have to talk to to Sean, to DFN, whatever. So I think we we, uh, that's, we we must try to distinguish what we want. And I don't think we want banning on demand to save cost. I think we want it because we want the ease of provisioning. So 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 this is really back to what Mauro was saying at some point in his presentation that the challenge of the coming years is really the user interfaces for provisioning all these nice mm -hmm. services and, and uh, that, that we are building. And, and the user interface, I agree. I fully agree. But the, the problem is what I was telling before, is the policies. In any case, you can't just open everything to everyone. We don't have yet enough resources. So we have to find at least a transition mechanism or something so that we understand. Because like, like when Jan opened the, the possibility for the NRN to create circuits, th there was a, a peak in the beginning and then it got stabilized. So, but but these, in this case, the resources may may be not so abundant, especially in the into the main part. So let us just agree. But mm -hmm. we can't just keep the, the political lay. That's my point. Mm -hmm. Well uh, I would like to make a comment because we saw I think several presentations where people said uh, we're not using half of the wavelength. So if you could agree to an approach to use alien wavelengths, apparently there is plenty of wavelengths available. And if you could stitch those through the networks Especially now that you have coherent, which is very tolerant to dispersion and PMD and other environments, <coughs> wouldn't that open doors to to do it? Mm. No, it's pure mm -hmm. It's pure circuit. So you have to end the circuit somewhere, and you have to propagate the circuit up to the Atlantic, which means fixed capacity. Well it starts becoming a very, very, very dense fixed matrix. The Atlantic is a special case, if you like because that's a submarine system, but the ter terrestrial systems, I would think you could uh, tackle the enemies to it. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. no, I don't want to monopolize, but if you look at Janna, the interdomain capacity is actually a lot of money that every NRM decides to take according to requirements. The possibility is cross-border fibers. The cross-border fibers is what I hope will be used more for these kind of things. But well, there are no exactly free resources on the free. official production network. That's my feeling. In, in, in the inter-domain part, not inside the domain. That's a major difference. Okay, in Italy we don't have any, also many wavelengths, but anyway, it's the inter-domain that really takes. If you plan o to channel all these resources through Giant, no way. Also because the cost-sharing working group has a cost according to the capacity you buy. This is the money. I, I mean, I don't like it, but it's how things are done. It's 26 million a year, just, just for basic things. So this is what we have to deal with. And we can't just say, okay, we have to do it. We have to suggest a way to do it. Technically and financially, that's our goal. And this is what we are discussing here. I think no one objects that technically is feasible. Fine. But then, we have to move one step forward and say, yes, it's feasible, and this is a rough idea of how I can do it. Also from the cost point of view and the policy point of view. I think the main problem with all these uh, technologies is uh, not, not, the, not the bandwidth and not the technology, but it's just the administration. Mm -hmm. as, as you said, once we get more requests than we would like to have, the, we end up in a, in, in a big problems. All these... Uh, Technique works fine for uh, a few cases only, but if you have thousands of cases, thousands of millions of people that want to reserve their bandwidth or have a direct channel, then we cannot handle it anymore. We have never succeeded. We have not succeeded with ATM, nor with uh, RSVP, nor with DiffSurf. All those techniques are available, are in the routers. We cannot use it because we cannot administer it. Ad administer it. And maybe this is, uh, this is the big difference that the uh, United States has because it's a uh, Single domain network, not the multi domain one. Okay, okay. Right. I mean, for, for me, this is then brings the question to uh, software defined networking. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, uh, if we look at bandwidth on demand or NSI, these are essentially uh, software defined networking concepts. Mm -hmm. So you're taking out mm -hmm. the problem of um, doing this in control plane and does the control plane scale in RSVP, uh, RSVP, TE, and so on. 
um, and and moving into into a software defined networking mm -hmm. problem. And I think in some ways that is the answer and where where we should be uh, looking. But software defined networking only works if you've got good standardized APIs. So I think sort of building a bit on the um, Mara was saying about um, uh, user interfaces, but I would, I would say uh, really APIs, uh, and these APIs need to be well standardized so that uh, there's a very tight, tightly written specification. Uh, then, uh, and then uh, we can get commercial implementations, and and then start moving this intelligence, uh, control plane intelligence, out, um, and, and and make a scalable solution that will work. And, and I think the answer to to why um, you know, you know the the, the problem of uh, bandwidth on demand is like, we haven't got enough users. But once it does scale, um, you know, having a, a quite a large infrastructure there, making the software work, suddenly does scale, and then it, mm. it will be a service that that, that, that will pay for itself. Um, you know, if you've got five wavelengths and you have to send a hundred emails to build a, uh, you know, mm. an Ethernet circuit to the US, that's that's a problem. Uh, but it doesn't scale as soon as you want a hundred or a thousand those wavelengths, the whole system breaks. Uh, and that's where that's why you need this sort of software defined uh, sort of distributed mm. management system to, to, to solve that problem. Right. Um, I think that software defined this is what I, I also claimed as a good technology. My point that we were making was the content of the information you exchange using software defined network. I mean, the API is fine, but then you have to put in the API some announcement of your mm -hmm. policies, some agreement, something, and that's the tough mm -hmm. part. Right. Actually, I, I think, actually, I believe that software-defined networking may make technically things easier, yes. but the content stays out. <laughs> that's the point. Well, I think uh, software-defined networking, there's a lot to be learnt uh, from organizations such as TMF who've uh, really had to tackle a much bigger problem than how do you request a circuit. But how do you actually request an entire sort of uh, ecosystem where you've mm -hmm. got uh, uh, monitoring and uh, debugging tools, uh, billing, and so on? And that's the kind of thing that there is a lot of experience out there <coughs> uh, in, in uh, you know in in places like TM Forum. Um, and I think that's probably the weakness that we have at the moment. We don't we don't necessarily have the scale and, and the background to, to to build those complex software systems, but. But it, you know, if we do have that ambition to do that kind of software network, I think we're facing the same problem as the guys who are doing OpenFlow, facing you know, how do you build a topology exchange? How do you do a, uh, a monitoring system and so on? Um, yeah, third and final. Yeah. On this one. I, 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 I find, of course, policy and costs are important, but I. I I don't think that they were even. They, I don't think that they were even a problem in the past, uh, or in the let's say we have these networks now. Bandwidth on demand is not really utilized. Yeah, we are still learning. Uh, I think as soon as it really becomes utilized, if it is going to be re realized, I think the money will come. And you can of course now discuss about money, but I, I think it's it's if you don't know yet how big your market is. Don't talk about money, because it, it, it will only inhibit uh, uh, the generation of ideas, in my opinion. The other thing is about also policies. Policies are there. They, are, they were there when we were in the, the Stone Age. Yeah? The role of policies were existing always. And but don't make that in, in inhibit us mm -hmm. for doing something. It's just an, a property of something. And I, I can do it or I can't do it. And if I can't do it, I can't do it. Or I do a, go to a commission to get it being done. Yeah? Uh, but see these things separate. I think that's what the OSU model did. Mm -hmm. See it as a separate thing and you have to solve it. Yeah, Don't shove it on the ground, but solve it. Yeah. So, I, I, well. I thank you about the comment, Victor. I, I'd like to move on. We have other topics. So I, I would like to. Ah, I'm the chair, but I can get a final <laughs> word. Um, we started with talking about the Americans and the European approach, right? And you could, we could have leveraged some of these arguments, but it will never work. And how do you share the cost and all that against IP and packet transport yeah. when, when it was invented? And uh, maybe if it had been invented in Europe, that would what would have happened, right? It wasn't so it was done in the US, it just did. Yeah. And maybe that is part of the difference. We're very, very good at thinking about reasons that won't work. 
rather than actually making it work. And I think I think that could be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, I'd like to talk actually about some some of the things about the way we built the networks. Um, so I, I grew up, or at least went to school and learned about the ISO OC seven layer model, and was confused for a little bit because in the real world I thought that there was physical infrastructure, and then there was some transport, and with IP, so it really wasn't a seven-layer model, it was a five-layer model, but we, you, you learn to cope with that thing, one thing to instruct or your professor, and, and do something else in the real world. I think what I'm seeing here, most of the presentation, I'm seeing different sort of layering. I'm seeing MPLS at the bottom, I'm seeing Ethernet on top of that, and then I'm seeing packet on top of that. So is, is that the new like protocol stack. And then I, I realized that under the MPLS there can be any number of virtualized layers. It could be one or a hundred or whatever. Right? Some people are doing MPLS on, on, on the optical and some people are doing MPLS on top of ten, ten layers or something else. But but is that is is the protocol stack changing? And are we agreeing on what the new protocol stack is or is the protocol stack exactly the same as it always was, it's just slight fluctuations and different approaches to doing the same thing? Yeah. I think according to, to what we learned in, in school, the protocol stack doesn't change. <coughs> because uh, still, when you, 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 you consider a layer one, you have uh, uh, bits, yeah? mm -hmm. you in layer two you have packets, in layer three you have addressing, and so on. Something changed because MPLS is something in the middle, yeah? but, but uh, we know already when, when the MPLS was uh, developed, it was something which which falls in 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 between two layers, yeah. Okay. But what what is changing is what we are doing with the the, the layers, yeah. So uh, traditionally, of course, uh, the the main uh, uh, thing was to to carry data over IP packets. So addressing was done mainly on basing on IP header, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now, what we're doing is we going f in in packet network. We're trying to build a circuits, yeah. So the, the decision making process is uh, a little bit different that it's not ip address right now to on, on today's presentation and yesterday <coughs> no one was on uh, the presentation was related to, to ip peerings yeah mm -hmm. but uh, all the presentation was was focused on delivering some sort of traffic yeah mm -hmm. so what what has changed i think is how how we using our, our, our network uh, and how different layers are, are, are applied. Yeah? So we can we can say okay, I have uh, my uh, IP MPLS uh, layer, so uh, something in the between layer two, uh, two and three. Yeah? I'm using to provide services for someone else. Someone else can build on top of that some some completely different service. He can use IP. He can create their own uh, the, his own circuits and and so on. Yeah? So what what has changed? I think is the way how we uh, build the network, but the the, uh, the the protocol stack I think is still the same. Okay. It's and I think it's very good to understand how what what is the role of each layer, mm -hmm. because then we can play uh, safely with with those new features. I, I agree with him. I think that um, uh, previously we only managed the IP layer, so this was the only layer where we can offer service. Mm -hmm. But right. now nowadays, uh, more or less all the embryos. Um, manage the physical one, layer two, layer three, and we are opening these layers to offer services uh, at these levels. So I think that this is the difference that we have opened the amount of services that we offer. So what you're saying, is that, that the difference the, the, is that uh, we used to the see stack is the same. so the stack service is what same. was at the top of the stack. Now yeah. there's a service interface yes. each layer, and there's even the programmability or some years ago, some years ago, we just uh, list capacity, and yeah. our only uh, management level was the IP. Yeah. This is the only um, um, layer that we can uh, configure service. But now we manage all levels, so we can uh, open our portfolio of, of services. Yeah, I, I think the services we provide to our clients hasn't changed, I think. It's still Ethernet IP and something below it. How we do it internally, I think, is exactly what you're saying. Uh, internally, we can stack every, or we can do anything over everything. Uh, uh, we can do it over pigeons and so on. So, but at the, at the edge, 
at that peering point, it's, it's, it hasn't changed uh, a long time, I think. We don't see IP MPLS. Normally, we don't see at, at a boundary uh, MPLS, let's say Ethernet MPLS, and then we normally don't see that to a client or even appearing to, to Giant or something like that. Okay. I, I have a slightly different view actually because um, my career started way back in a, a telephone company, Telstra, back in the 90s and, 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 and we had a stack there which was really quite different. I mean, we talked about basically SDH, uh, ATM started to creep in and, and so on. But really um, those lower layers never really, uh, um, the, the RME network really took off in those lower layers in, in, uh, with WDM, certainly in Janot in 2005. So I don't know as many people actually attempted to implement. Uh, I guess there was a, there, there was a, uh, an ATM layer in Janot before my time. So, but the thing, uh, my view is the more things change, the more they stay the same. So, you know, okay, uh, SDH is dead, but now we've got uh, OTN and OTN. Is, well, what's the difference between OTN and SDH? It's sort of, sort of next generation SDH and, and does a lot of the, solves the same problems that, that, that SDH did. And, and again, uh, ATM is dead, but now we've got MPLS and uh, again, so it's a connection oriented. Uh, yeah, that's the other view, that nothing so has really changed. We're right, just giving right. you names. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and OpenFlow will fail for the same reason that, that the 10 thing that did the thing before will fail. Right. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I think that mm -hmm. I am a big fan of IP to <coughs> The architecture of IP B, which is the internet, the original internet architecture, I think is something that should be valued at the right point. The fact that IP it can run on everything, including features, is what actually allowed that architecture mm -hmm. to perform very well in a technically fast developing environment. Mm -hmm. I think it's our role also to defend that architecture because it proved to be very, very scalable and very effective. And one of the key components of that architecture is the fact that the con flow control is at the end of the network mm -hmm. and is not in the center of it. And that's the main difference which mm -hmm. is missing in the circuit environment. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't require so policy. if you ask me about IP TCP, I hope it will never change in the sense that mm -hmm. it should change, it will change, mm -hmm. but the uh, preserving the key features of that. Mm. But what concerns the various technologies, they're changing so fast that they don't care. Mm. What I try to say is that I see more and more focus on optics. What worried me in this um, workshop is that everyone has a different optical vendor. Mm -hmm. And that's the risk I see for us. Because indeed, it's they do not really talk one to each other so easily. And this is what worries me. And this is, again, a difference in respect to the United States. Mm -hmm. And so this is a technical barrier that it will be hard to overcome to have common services. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've discussed that <coughs> in Wave stuff a number of times. Mm -hmm. if, if, if there are a future where there will be standardization at the optical layer so that we can do <coughs> cross-platform or cross-vendor networking at the optical layer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The last few times we talked about it, we, the answer was no. <coughs> is, is there a new answer now? No, I think <laughs> at the moment it's still the case that, uh, especially for the coherent technology, that you see that uh, most vendors have their own waves. Uh, yeah. kind of, so so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we are trying to, to merge things that are, uh, are there bread and butter there, they are having different relation formats of DSPs and perform better than others, just like you have your different router vendors and they have different routing tables or whatever they, it's called. Uh, so it's the differentiation between the vendors that we are trying to, to merge and that exactly. don't, I don't think that would happen. Uh, and, and that would also kill the innovation in the optical domain because then it would be the lowest denominator. And the lowest denominator already exists in OGN with the with the fake encoding, and that fake is never used, right? It's an option in some equipment, but if you want to stretch it and maybe skip a, a, a heart or something, you can add a, a better encoding in the fake, and that would save you the in -run money, but at the same time, you would like them to interoperate. So that will not happen. Right. But actually, alien wavelengths will kind of solve that, because then you can traverse the different domains mm -hmm. using one technology. Correct. So, uh, yeah, I have one remark because 
you mentioned something like well, there are many different uh, uh, different systems in, in NRNs, mm -hmm. but I think <coughs> this is good because uh, sure. it's it's a result of uh, of competitors, the competition between vendors. Yeah, we right now just just look at we are we are facing a differences in, in physical layer, yeah? Everyone is trying to do the, the faster transmission with longer distance and so on. Mm -hmm. If we would like to standardize something, yeah? We will wait, for like, like, like with 100G, we will wait until everyone goes to the point where it will be ready to offer services, or we will never get uh, a standard, yeah? Or we will stay, for instance, uh, everyone uh, is able to, to listen to uh, FM radio. What, what happens? If there, are, there are standardized uh, receivers, standardized transmitters, n n nothing changes, yeah? And the, the, the situation we have in, 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 in Europe right now is, I think, it's very, very, from, from, from this workshop I found out, many options available and adjusted to, to, the, to the real needs, yeah? So, so this is the result of, of competition, not only uh, uh, on the, on the uh, scientist level, but also from the uh, uh, vendor's level. Yeah? So I think this is positive, something. It's very positive. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Well, I like the glass half full. <laughs> 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 I want the glass half empty. I mean, you are half full. Eh? It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Um, but I, I agree with Mauro that the, the, there should be some, some, some efforts to, to available this, those system to, to uh, collaborate together. Yeah, I totally agree. So, coming back to my original question, mm. one reason it might seem that the protocol stack is changing might simply be that we employ more and more technology that allow us to virtualize part of the, of the infrastructure, which means that in some sense, sometimes the protocol stack is repeating. Mm -hmm. And we build up to a certain level, and we start over because we create an MPLS substrate on top of a lot of stuff, and then do it, do it all over again, for good reasons. Because we we want to do things like Federica, that actually is an IP network on top of something on top of an IP network. Right. So there we have the protocol stack repeating, but but for good reasons. Right. So so, so that might be that. Right. All right. We have a little bit of time left, and There's I'd like to spend. There. Question. Uh, one sorry, one. sorry, 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 sorry. Last question, but additional comments to competition and issues. Uh, I think it is early and not mature, not mature state of competition. I have some experience with design of electrical circuits. Uh, there was a long, long period when it uh, was possible to use any circuits in design, but without guarantee of uh, common uh, common rules. After some time, designers understand that it is wrong, and uh, producers, manufacturers of digital circuits, understand that it's necessary to have some multi-source agreement, and users and designers understand <coughs> that who is out of multi-source agreement mm -hmm. is not possible to use. Mm -hmm. It is something as standardization, but not by official approach, mm -hmm. but by agreement of members, agreement of manufacturers. It is question <laughs> how long we will wait mm -hmm. for such yeah. <laughs> better world, but Coming. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And on the other hand, we may also be looking at the, uh, uh, into the right layer for interoperability. Basically, uh, there are yeah, there is one layer above which is IP, uh, which is interoperable, uh, and there is one layer below which is the physical spectrum which could be interoperable, mm. once we choose, it's up to us to choose it, to use it as a basis for communication. That's a alien that's wave. Alien wave approach, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a place that, well, if, uh, even if it's uh, 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 in terms of grid, uh, everybody is using it. Mm. And even if it's gridless, you can uh, switch the portions of spectrum, mm. so to speak. To get uh, and then uh, uh, the um, electro optical. Well, that's uh, it may not be in a, interoperable anywhere in the in the near future. So we have a bit of time left. Um, one 
one final thing I'd like you to consider is that. Um, may, I, may, I no, sorry, yeah. may I something? I, I want to point on one thing in uh, inter Internet 2 with the example on SDN because uh, we are talking here about develop some SDN solution and then provide it. But in uh, Internet 2 they only provide to researcher to researchers open flow capability mm -hmm. and the researchers developing the SDN solution. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. right. We are developing solutions like telco operators, mm -hmm. but we are enhanced. Mm -hmm. We have different goals. If uh, some researcher wants to develop something instead of MPLS, mm -hmm. he need fiber footprint, so we have to find a way how to provide them a fiber footprint, only fiber footprint. Right. We uh, some solutions, some some solution may be alien waves or or dark fiber test bed so develop so Last there is a there is difference yeah. the has been very production oriented we are um, more to provide production services but we have to allow, allow experimentation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. so a final thing is that i think at a conference not so long ago, I think it was Ingrid Melbe at Uninet who said that um, wired networking is really only for big, big servers for supercomputing and things like that. And everything else is wireless. So the all the users aren't wireless, wireless is for users. And I know that much of wireless right now is contained in a room like what we have in here, but I didn't hear anything about wireless. And certainly nothing about mobile in this talk. Um, even though that I know from, from if I walk out to that inland community most of the people I know who's using the internet aren't using it on a fixed thing anymore right. all the kids are using listening to music over their mobile phones streaming over IP over whatever cell network um, it still seems that we are not in the inland community we do like this but because we're ignoring it because we don't know how to tackle it or well, why why are we not looking at that have any of you inlands considered um, mobile? Oh, we do a lot with uh, wireless, yep. but I think uh, as myself, the people that are here are more the, the backbone oriented people, so yeah. we manage to build a fast and reliable backbone and uh, yeah. it's, it's a, a complete different uh, domain. So you, th you, th you think the mobile and, and the backbone are yeah, it's, it's yeah. different technologies and different people, and it's 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 very very often used and very ha heavily used in the campuses, not in the not in the backbone. And so we may might be the right the wrong people here to discuss okay. mobile. So that might be one explanation. Yeah. Victor, no, I, I think wireless becomes very important. I think um, I, I, one of the reasons why it might have a lot of influence on, on us as the backbone people is that. Everybody has these mobile devices. Uh, they access the normal internet, so they don't need any more the, the let's say the university network. Yeah, if you go to the LTE networks, the main servers like the Blackboards and the Googles and the Amazons that people are using are also outside the environment. environment. Mm -hmm. uh, even the administrative systems of, of universities are outside their local environment or the environment environment. So. At some moment, if we are going, and, and I think a wireless port is cheaper than a wired port. That's already what I hear, uh, at least a Wi-Fi port, so yeah. we still need to. So there, there are nuances, but I, I see that it, it could be that, 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 that the wire, uh, yeah, the mobile network becomes bigger than the backbone network. Um, so there is a danger there. I think luckily the, the mobile people can't transport all the data, so they want to offload it to the wired network. So I think there's still some uh, uh, relation there. But I think it's it becoming more and more important, and we will have to, to adjust to that, I think. Uh, 
I don't know what the traffic I see the traffic going down in my network. It was two two times per year. Uh, a few years ago it was 1.4, 1.3, this year it's 1.2. Uh, this could be due to economic crisis we have, but it could also be due to the fact that we are stimulating, we are giving the students dongles for, for Wi-Fi or 3G access. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they're doing, but there is, a, there is something uncontrollable there. And we have to make it controllable in some way, I think. And we have to be aware of it. Is it also the case that, that with wireless users are moving between domains all the time, and yep. so we will have to interwork with commercial offerings because when they move down the street here, we yep. are out of the reach of yep. the campus. Network. I don't think that we can provide, although I think there is an opportunity for us to, to, to see, certainly with LTE 4G, how that offloads to the Wi-Fi of, of, of our clients. And I think there is something, so it's not providing 4G networks, but I think it's, it's providing together with these commercials, see how that works. And I think Switch mm -hmm. is, is doing something like that, or perhaps something different. But I think you have to be active in that environment to, to, to play with it and, and uh, be still there in five years. Yeah, I'd like to ask Switch, yeah. you, you, really, you, you don't think that, that when you interwork with offerings that provide Wi-Fi everywhere, so, so that your in-ren service is essentially available everywhere. Doesn't that change your network architecture, the core network, the backbone architecture? No, the, it doesn't change the core, uh, the backbone no. architecture. Mm -hmm. it, it, there are a lot of changes at the, at the edges, at the campuses. That the uh, wireless becomes much more important, maybe also hotspots all over the place. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you, you need a uh, the backbone that is 100 gigabit capable. I'm, I'm sure we need it. Because traffic is uh, on the backbone, traffic yeah. is still increasing. Yeah. Right. We have an, uh, uh, you might know, we have an agreement with uh, public providers so that all students can uh, use public hotspots for free, Switzerland, and uh, the providers that can not cope mm. with the load mm. system just break down, and they has now, they have now shown uh, much more interest in the in the last year uh, on the campus networks. On the on the Wi-Fi on the campus to offload their network. Mm. So they, they for some years it was very fragile contract with them. We never knew when they close it down they, because they always said they're losing money. Mm. But now they are happy that uh, they can at least offload a little bit of their traffic to the to the university campus because their networks mm. cannot cope anymore. When the train from Bern and the Zurich main stations, the whole network is dead. Just that. You have to wait 10 minutes because everybody has his <laughs> iPhone in there. They cannot cope yeah. with the growth. So there is an opportunity yes. there for us. There is an opportunity. There is a big opportunity for, I think, for the universities. Hmm. Maybe LTE yeah. is not oh. yet LTE. Yeah. Maybe LTE can make it better, but the growth yeah. is, uh, the demand is uh, much, uh, without limits. Mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we have also to think that. The architecture of the provider of wireless network is drastically different from what we have. Mm -hmm. yep. And in particular, the provider's network do nasty things with DNS, do caches, and put a lot of firewalls and filters. Mm -hmm. For these reasons, I don't like that type of networking, because I think it actually closes the innovation capabilities of the researchers and of the students, and you can't really do what they want, mm -hmm. and usually you don't have a problem. So, I think that we should compare, instead of the technology, the use of the network and the user interface. Mm -hmm. And the two user interfaces um, is in the wireless is much poorer from the provider than we can offer through Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. through standard things, and so on. And this is what we should correctly evaluate rather than the technology. Right, but then the challenge is to mm. provide the, the, the kind of quality we provide everywhere, I guess. Right. Yeah, it's not the quality number of bits per second. No, no. no. It's the quality in the terms of the use you can have. Yeah. But maybe uh, I think also we are discussing different things here because I think many, many people have the notion of that we are supporting big science and, and that's why everything has to go to the university and good quality, etc. etc. But one of the outrages in, in Nordnet was people watching the uh, cross country uh, skiing uh, tournament and uh, the Norwegians cut themselves off. 
so so students and professors they are also human and they are googling they are watching mm -hmm. the royal yeah. wedding etc etc and I, I think for that reason we, if we want to support that and, and let's say spread it to rooms for people who can watch a, a football game live then we also have to move into that space and I agree well big science is not done on the wireless network because it doesn't have maybe sufficient uh, capacity and quality etc etc but everybody is using their, their phones to, to tweet and to, to be on Facebook and all that stuff that is part of, of our day, everyday life and we are not doing big science uh, now and everybody has their laptops up anyway and maybe you are in Edinburgh and, and, and send an email so I think we have to move into that space and and you can elaborate on the Zunet thing uh, about in Sweden also they have uh, they have spread uh, Edinburgh on all public places now through uh, a wholesale agreement. So we are coming there, and it's interesting to see where they go from mm -hmm. on that initiative. I fully support that in the sense that no longer research is done in our ivory towers in universities. Mm -hmm. More and more, there is a push to apply ICT in the society and innovate in the society using networks and using other things and so on. And for that, indeed, the NRMs have a decision in front of them, which is whether to decide to help in some way a broader set of communities, so just restrict to a smaller set of communities. The same applies to universities. I don't think the university can stay their campuses, not mix really, trying to do things with medicine, uh, biology, chemistry, on, on the society. And in this case, I fully support that. In principle, we should allow to open to the society. I think to that, the last remark there, that sometimes when you listen to the commission, or sometimes when we talk in big shang meetings, we get lost in the idea that r and networking is all about CERN and the 10 big S3 projects, huge traffic flows. Mm -hmm. When you go and talk to the Catholics in the system, it's all about the 40 millions of users. And then, oh yeah, but that's crazy. This is over. They give them a 10 gig, so they shut up. Right? Um, <laughs> but that's not their problem. Their problem is managing the millions of users. And I think we have to balance that. Thing. All right. Um, I think we could go on for a long time. But that's a good. I have more notes and more <laughs> topics, but we're actually out of time. Um, I think people have fights to catch. Any closing remarks from the panel? Anybody else? I, I found it a, a, a good session, by the way. I'm, I'm glad that this uh, idea popped up again. I, uh, I think we should do this more. <laughs> Agree. But that's my opinion. <laughs> and just a reminder to the feedback. So I, I distributed an email. <laughs> feedback, so please. And, and of course, everything that happened here. You're not going to be able to run away from, from it because it was recorded and it will be archived and be available to tell the people at home who, didn't, who couldn't come here that it will be there. I'm sure Peter, Peter will let us know where to find all the video and things like that. Oh, yeah. get that put in. Um, so that, thanks very much for, for coming to this session and for contributing and thanks very much for everybody to be in this work. Thank you. Thank you.